will now give the floor to the um, to the carbon pricing team uh, with uh, Claudia Basta, who is going to facilitate the discussion. Thank you, um, Claudia from the Netherlands. I am a researcher and I have been involved in Science for Democracy that was just mentioned from the establishment of the associations about two years ago. And thanks to uh, Science for Democracy that was established by Marco Perduca and Marco Capato, I have been involved into the conception of one of the two uh, European citizens initiatives of which we're going to talk today. Uh, that's not going to be me doing it, but the people who are actively now uh, working on the uh, next steps of uh, the initiatives in terms of uh, collection of signatures, campaignings, and etc. So uh, my job today is to get to terms with my phone first, and then second, to moderate uh, these um, contributions. We will have five speakers. Um, I'm going to take the timing of the presentations, starting with a little more flexibility with the first presentations, because it's based on a PowerPoint that we want to have the time to see and share. And it's going to be given by Carlo Maresca. Carlo Maresca is the coordinator of the European Citizens Initiatives on Carbon Pricing. Um, he's going to talk. Um, we have constructed the presentations in such a way that will be continuity among them. And we start with talking about what the, where the steps taken from the scientific evidence on uh, CO2 emissions, climate, climate uh, change impacts of CO2 emissions. So what the science tell us regarding why uh, it will be desirable and justified from the political point of view to have a carbon pricing policy in the first place. So I leave the floor to Carlo. Thank you, Claudia. Claudia. Hello to everyone. So I'm Carlo and I'm an environmental and economics student in Milan. And uh, I think that the, the European Citizens Initiative that we are promoting, that uh, the name is stopglobalwarming.eu, is a crucial instrument in the fight to the climate emergency. This ACI asks uh, to the European Commission to put a price on climate altering emissions. And this is an economic and environmental instrument that offers to citizens, governments, uh, and policymakers a concrete solution to cut emission at the scale and the speed that is necessary. But why we have decided to implement an initiative on carbon pricing to fight climate emergency? 27 Nobel Prize, four former president of the Federal Reserve, 15 former president of the Council of Economic Advisors, two former secretaries of the USA Treasury Department, and many thousands of economists from uh, the USA and from, okay, right, and from all over the world, acknowledge that the, a carbon tax offers uh, the most effective levers uh, to cut um, climate altering emissions, economically, socially, and environmentally wise, but also, when uh, declaring the climate emergency, um, 11,000 scholars identify six things to do immediately to get out in a, in a statement that sets out uh, uh, vital signs as indicator of magnitude of the climate emergency. And these goals may be achieved uh, by the European Citizens uh, Initiative and there are the transition to renewable sources, the reduction of greenhouse gases emissions, and uh, a transition to a carbon-free economy. Now we will see a short video produced by um, the International Monetary Fund about the social and environment, uh, environmental benefits uh, of carbon pricing. We have some problem with the audio, so 
I think it's not the best thing to do to watch all this video. And uh, It's clear, okay. Um, according to the EMF that shows in this video all this uh, information, taxing fossil fuels is the most uh, effective tool in the fight against global warming. But it must to be accompanied by lower taxes and uh, support measures for the most uh, affected social groups. And uh, now I can I will show you. Um, mm, a summary table that show the m information and the futures of uh, some alternative mitigation approaches like carbon tax, emission trading systems, feed base and regulation. Um, as it can be seen in this summary table, a carbon tax has full potential of, for exploiting mitigation opportunities it uses also pricing and market mechanism. And uh, with a carbon tax, people and firms choose most efficient way of reducing emissions. It uh, has also a price predictability, predictability that is a crucial uh, to maximize the political and social feasibility of this policy, of this uh, economic and environmental policy. And uh, a carbon tax, uh, it's uh, the only approach to generate sh for sure the s revenues and also as the smallest uh, administ administrative burden uh, that the others futures of alternative mitigation approaches. Now, let's talk about the proposal driven by this ACI, this uh, European Citizen Initiative. Our request to the European uh, Commission are to put a minimum price on CO2 emissions starting from 50 euro per tons per CO2 tons from 2020 until 100 euro within 2025. Sorry for the mistake in the slides. And uh, we ask also to abolish the actual systems of free allowance um, to you polluters in the emission trading system and also to improve a border adjustment mechanism on uh, non-EU uh, imports and uh, uh, high revenues deriving from these policies of carbon pricing will be allocated for European policies that encourage energy saving and the use of variables and uh, reduce taxation on the lower incomes. A carbon tax is also the most efficient economic tool to reduce altering, climate altering uh, emissions in terms of quantity of emissions to be reduced and the time needed to reach the target. Okay. Okay. To maximize the social acceptability yeah, this is the last, sorry. To maximize the social ac acceptability and the fairness and the political feasibility of this policy, all revenues must, uh, uh, will be invested in the reduction of the, uh, to reduce labor taxes of the lowest incomes. And uh, citizens uh, must will receive more than prices rise to directly and concretely benefit from the CO2 dividends. Further, mm, to, mm, also, it's uh, important to protect the European competitiveness and uh, to prevent carbon leakage. So, 
we asked to the European Commission to um, implement a border carbon adjustment mechanism. A carbon tax should increase from here to here. This will end once the emission reduction target is reached. Um, a, pro a progressive CO2 emissions price increase will encourage technical technological innovation and the development of large-scale energy infrastructure. So, this is, I think, the last slide. And uh, a sufficiently robust and gradually rising carbon tax will also replace the need for various carbon regulation that are also uh, less efficient. The replacement of existing highly fragmented and uncertain regulation with a carbon tax may feed economic growth and provide companies with the regulator certainty need to invest in sustainable, in sustainable development in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, presentation. I just want to highlight something of it. Um, all I know about European citizens' initiatives, and you, I know it through uh, the platform that was established to uh, set up this specifically. And what I really think that should be highlighted of this initiative, correct me if I'm wrong, Carlo, is the fact that um, a measure which is considered from the largest majority possible of economists, but also natural scientists and climate scientists to be effectively reducing and to be uh, effectively giving incentives, reducing, of course, um, the impacts of CO2 and climate change, and in this case, emissions, and uh, effectively give incentives to investments in green technologies um, is framed also within a broader idea of also um, uh, acting on the welfare of the European Union by reallocating the revenues to cutting tax on the lower incomes and uh, therefore also to set up the first form of uh, Europe-wide uh, uh, form of welfare policy. So I think that the combination of these two is um, what really uh, I find the innovative aspect of, the, of this uh, European initiative. Pablo Berjano, uh, who is the person who is going to present next, Um, follow up on the presentations of Carlo, which focused on the content and objectives of the uh, initiative. And is going to explain us what it means to actually steer an initiative of this size and ambition from the point of view of the processes and the tools that are, are to be put in place actually to make it actually work. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Thank you, Claudia, for the introduction. So, as Claudia mentioned, I help Carlo Maresca define and execute the strategy that is needed to bring such powerful tool to actually a real policy. So, we've seen, we've clearly stated that our goal is to stop global warming. And our belief is that taxation should be on pollution rather than on work. The tool that we decided to use was an ICE on carbon tax, but this it's just the first point. So once that we have, once that we have a good policy, how do we commit to execute a solid strategy so that it really becomes a good policy? And it could go to the European Commission. So I remember you that the goal is to reach one million signatures that are needed for this policy to get to the European Commission and start the le legislative process. So I'm an engineer, so let me do some maths to give you an idea on what would it take with a traditional way of uh, collecting signatures from a committee of seven people. So the goal is, again, uh, gathering one million signatures. And if we consider that a, a standard table of collecting signatures is an afternoon, we'll connect about 100 signatures. That will mean bringing together 10,000 tables for collective signatures in the whole Europe in a year. So considering that, that typically tables are taken in the weekends, so that will mean that every weekend, us as a committee should be able to organize 200 tables in the whole Europe. And I leave this question to you. Is it feasible for a committee of seven European citizens to organize 200 tables in Europe every weekend? But luckily, this is not all the tools that we have. So we are in the digital area, and we can collect dig uh, signatures also digitally. So 
we have a, a website, stopglobalwarming.eu, where you can sign online in a few minutes. And we supported this with a social media campaign. So we worked together with an art director and a copywriter, so Andre Andreoli and Avi Candeli, who created content and a social media strategy that were needed to share our policy through the digital, uh, the digital social medias. So here's an example that uh, the digital content that we created. And ex an example that you can see on how we, we share the content through some of our uh, social media platforms. All this content was defined to be able to be um, to be executed through a very specific strategy and timeline. So here you can see uh, the details of all the content that was provided uh, in the first month. So for each, each content was uh, delivered in exactly the best time uh, following the European uh, institutions, um, let's say processes, and also through the uh, the climate strikes that were happening around the world. But again. Is this strategy enough to reach one million people without a pre-existing wide group of followers? So we're starting from a committee of seven European citizens. So we decided to go even further, so to create a network. So presenting our ECI to other organizations and ask them to fully support the initiative. So here you can see our coordinator, Virginia Fiume, presenting the ECI to the Italian Greens, the Green Party, and they actually supported, fully supported the initiative. We also joined the global climate strike organized by Fridays for Future. But let me give you an example of the power of this last method. So creating a network to reach the one million signatures. So if, one, if just one personality could be involved in the campaign, we could reach one million signatures in one day. This is just one example. So there are a lot of people who are working already uh, towards stop global warming. But if we work together, we could really reach our target within 12 months. So how, we, how, how are we uh, expanding our network? So we are empowering the people that we reach through webinars. So we are explaining them how they can organize a signature collection table, how they can spread the word through social media, and last but not least, to present the proposal to other organizations. So let me give, uh, leave you with a, f a final and key message. So what is needed to bring such uh, tools, or ECI, to a final policy is to create a network. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have to say, I felt a bit guilty during your presentations because I am of, I sit among the seven citizens of the first committee that was established to launch the um, initiatives. And in fact, I'm definitely not an Instagrammer, I'm not a Facebooker, I'm just a very ordinary person. <laughs> we know big audiences of followers at all. And I have to say, this perspective is kind of making me realize really the importance of all the time and activities that you guys are investing in uh, creating this network as you concluded your slides, because it's really necessary. And indeed, it might take just to having one person who endorses us with a big group of followers, perhaps for us to succeed. So let's hope this after this event of this today is going to happen. Um, I'm going to introduce now uh, the third speaker. Eleonora Evi, member of the European Parliament. Thank you very much for being with us. You were elected in the Parliament with the Movimento Cinque Stelle, who is a movement indeed, which is now in the coalitions of the Italian government. And you have been very active in environmental committees at European level. And I've read a bit of your contributions on all topics ranging from energy, industry, and indeed the environment. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you from my side as well. It's a real pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. Indeed, I've been a member of the European Parliament in the previous uh, term uh, as a member of the two committees, uh, the Environment Committees and Petition Committees. <laughs> oh, sorry. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Maybe. Okay. Um, 
and I've been re-elected now for my second mandate and I will be continue working on the same two committees, uh, environment and petition, which are <laughs> very much uh, in focus for the topic we are um, talking today. Uh, and I am very honored and glad to be one of the, I, I guess the first MEP <laughs> so far that has signed this initiative and I hope and I'm sure many other colleagues will join um, this initiative. Um, that I believe it is very timely and crucial. Uh, the moment uh, uh, it's really important now uh, to put a pressure on this new commission uh, because we have to do uh, much. We have uh, such a huge work ahead of us in order to uh, take to tackling uh, uh, global warming and fight climate change. And uh, Europe has to be uh, on board and has to lead this um, these fight. And I am, in general, a strong supporter of ECIs, uh, since also in the past term I've been working in the revision of this tool. Unfortunately, I have to say, um, this tool, um, uh, hey, which is a powerful tool, and I will uh, just make you some short uh, example of previous ECIs that, has been, uh, that have been successful in the past, still do not impose to the European Commission any kind of action. The European Commission is always free to um, to um, collect and to um, uh, take the uh, proposals and the requests by the European citizens, but of course the transformation into law, it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult process. Uh, but uh, just, just give me some, uh, I just wanted to give some short uh, um, uh, thoughts uh, uh, about the ECI on, um, on carbon pricing. Because we really believe, I really believe that we desperately need uh, a shift uh, in the way we produce and use energy, in the way we move, the, the, the food we eat, uh, the, how we heat and cool our uh, buildings. And there are a set of policies already there by the European Commission, by the European Union, uh, then implemented at national level that try to do so. But how, they, how these policies have been effective so far? We have to move. We have to take this major shift towards concrete and effective measures. That, that, that's why I really believe that putting a price on carbon is an effective measure. And I believe that carbon price applied to products would reflect the carbon footprint of these products in a fair way thus incentivizing a sustainable production and consumption while at the same time applying one of the best principles we had, which is the polluter pays principle. That has been so far, in my opinion, too often neglected and sometimes misused. And in particular, in my opinion, this happened in the, in the ETS, the Emission Trade Scheme, uh, as uh, despite the uh, sincere and, uh, and good uh, uh, objectives and commitments, uh, in, on the ground it hasn't really bring, brought uh, the reduction we, we need in the industrial uh, and energy sector. The, why? Because, uh, in my opinion, it has failed in its objective to reduce emissions because in industries have continued emitting without any real, real incentive to move towards a more sustainable production. Why? Because the price put on the CO2 uh, allowances were, was, were too uh, small, were simply too uh, little. Uh, to stimulate any kind of investments and industry, therefore, continue and prefer to keep pay paying such a small amount of money uh, and continue to pollute. Thus, in, in a sense, reversing the polluting pay principle. I pay quotas just to continue to pollute instead of having like a remedy kind of um, action as the polluter pays principle in my opinion should be applied uh, correctly and the other thing that has been very bad is is that they um, there has been always too many free allowances given to basically all the sectors to um, to to, uh, to to continue to pollute and this ended up in a situation where even by the way some industries uh, made huge windfall also so which uh, windfall profit on out of this system 
Uh, but now it is clear that we really have to change. We really have to get change the current situation and inject new ideas and new proposals to fuel the debate on the effective solutions. And uh, we are, as I said, in a crucial historical momentum for the European environment and climate policy. And I have a very high expectation on this new uh, commission. And the new commission uh, show commitment, uh, of course, on this biggest challenge that we have to face, which is the climate change. And the European Green Deal has been announced yesterday. I, I'm sure many of you have followed the work. Uh, and I believe it goes in the right direction. Yesterday, the Commission has clearly said uh, that uh, the EU um, climate policy on, is on the top priority of its agenda, and this has never happened before, so it's really something positive. Uh, but the clock, as I said, is ticking, and there is no more time uh, to hesitate, and we need huge and ambitious objective to solve the climate emergency. Uh, and th as I said then, I believe this proposal is really on the on the right side, so putting a person or cam or, or on carbon is really something we need desperately. I just want to uh, spend a few words on the uh, ECI tool, because I guess my time is running out, so I, I will be very short. Uh, the ECI tool, as I said, it's a powerful and a unique opportunity for citizens to make their voice heard and shape the EU policy by uh, asking the European Commission to make a legislative proposal. It is a, a tool to influence lawmakers and a great instrument of their democracy, which obliges the EU institutions to listen to citizens once the one million signatures have been uh, collected. Just a few examples of what has already happened in the past. One successful uh, example I want to make uh, is the most recent uh, ECI on end cage age uh, to um, put an end to the use of cages in uh, animal farming that has surpassed the threshold of uh, 1.6 million signatures and we will in the coming months uh, um, having uh, hearings and uh, uh, the, um, the initiative presented at the, in the European Parliament. But still you might say, okay, what will happen? Do you have any... Uh, successful ECI that really bring a change, well, there is. Uh, there is one uh, which is right to water. I'm sure you, you heard about that. It was in back in 2014. Uh, these ECI were asking to uh, enshrine the, the right to water into the EU law and provide and ensure that uh, the right to access to water is provided to everybody, to every citizen. And, um, even though the European Commission at the beginning replies uh, in a negative, negative way, uh, after a few years, in 2018, uh, on, during the revision of the Drinking Water Directive, there was a specific, a specific article put into the new legislation, to, in this new revision uh, um, and the new the revised proposal, uh, on access to water. Thus, responding concretely to the call of citizens. Uh, this revision is still ongoing. We are on the trilogues, uh, um, so the inter-institutional negotiations between Parliament, Commission, and European Council. And I really hope, because the Parliament uh, did, 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 did a good job in, in terms of also to, to push forward the call from European citizens, and we will have, I hope, let's keep fingers crossed, the, the, the very first uh, directive that really replied to, in a consistent way to NECI. So um, just to conclude, uh, I wish you <laughs> all the best and my support as well to, to, to collect uh, as much as possible, many signatures that we desperately need uh, to, to move um, things forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I have, uh, I really take the freedom to have, to add 30 seconds of comments. First, thanks a lot. You shared a lot of interesting content. I'm very glad to hear that you were involved also in a discussion as member of the European Parliament on perspectives of reform of the ECI tool in itself. So you might be invited to our next webinar <laughs> in which, because one of the initiatives we had in mind once, it's nearly a joke, but a serious joke was an ECI on how to reform the ECI. So we will be one of the brains put at work with us for this. And the second is that uh, indeed, um, you are the ambassador, you are our ambassador as of now in the European Parliament for this specific ECI. So we really count on you and your enthusiasm for supporting us. 
Um, there will be time, I also wanted to say, for questions later, so I'm not like taking the word from speakers and they're not going to be involved in a discussion anymore, so remain with us, please. Um, now I have the most difficult name to pronounce among all the speakers of today, but... Yeah, uh, I can... Uh, after all the train. Timothy Galvary. Near. Timothy Galvary. Close, close. Um, coordinator of the ECI on aviation tax. The floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm Timothy. I'm from France, and uh, I launched an ECI on uh, carriers and taxation. So I was asked uh, two things to present uh, why I started the ECI and uh, the strategy we pursued to get the one million signatures. You can also speak French. As you prefer. Oh, no, I, I, I wrote my notes in English. Uh, okay. um, so it all started uh, one year ago when, uh, you know, you remember the Yellow Vest, uh, the Gilets Jaunes movement? Uh, in France, they were really much complaining because uh, the French government had decided to increase uh, a lot taxes on car fuels. Whereas there was uh, still a big niche, uh, a an industry with a big, big uh, a privilege because uh, its its tax was not uh, its its fuel was not taxed, uh, the aviation sector. So uh, Macron said, "I'm not going to tax kerosene for uh, domestic flights." Whereas, whereas he could have done so, and uh, he decided to move the conversation to the European level. But uh, back then, in December one year ago, nothing was happening at the European level. Nobody was taxing. Ab nobody was talking about uh, kerosene taxation or even uh, a fairer price on um, on the aviation industry. So uh, that's how uh, it all started. Then we started doing uh, with my partners some more research, and we discovered that not only there's no uh, kerosene ta taxation, but there's also no VAT on international plane tickets and that actually only six EU member states tax um, international air travel. Uh, so that's why plane tickets are so cheap and that's why Ryanair can offer five euro uh, ticket taxes. Uh, sorry, t yeah, ticket, uh, ticket. Sorry, that's why Ryanair can offer five, 10, 20 euros uh, air tickets. Uh, so there was this big problem uh, because obviously, because of these tax advantages, everyone is really encouraged to take the plane instead of taking the, the, the train, right? So we really wanted to change this absurd taxation because uh, trains do not enjoy these uh, uh, tax benefits because, as you know, there's VAT on train tickets and, uh, and uh, trains, if they, if they run with diesel, there's all, there are also taxes on this diesel and uh, the ETS also covers the electricity uh, used by trains. So that was really absurd and we thought that we needed to take action and as EU uh, citizens, we have only one tool at hand, right? The ECI. So we, we, we decided to use it with a, a few friends from my classroom and uh, from my dormitory. So it was very a local uh, initiative from, from Maastricht. Um, but that was also a very big problem because uh, it doesn't only incentivize everyone to take the plane instead of the train. Uh, it's also boosting, boosting, boosting aviation missions because they increase by over 5% a year. And they already represent almost 4% of uh, EU's emissions. So it might, some, it might not seem a lot, but it's one particular sector whose emissions are growing, growing, growing very rapidly. Um, so talking about the strategy, uh, we found a few partners, uh, especially Brussels-based NGOs such as uh, Transport and Environment, who is uh, the leading NGO on the issue. Um, we also partnered with uh, more local initiatives and with uh, bigger networks, such as uh, Stay Grounded, the Stay Grounded network. And uh, once we launched the, the ECI, uh, we figured out it was much, much more challenging than it actually looks because I was so optimistic. I was thinking, that's such a great idea. I'm going to get one million signatures within a week. Uh, it's perfect timing. Everybody's talking about climate issues. And saying that getting one million signatures is challenging, it's an understatement. It's really, really extremely, extremely hard. Uh, well, the numbers talk by themselves, right? Over 80, eight, so, sorry, over 80 ECIs were started and only five got one million signatures so far. So yeah, that's really challenging. And the main issue is because citizens don't know about it, everyone I talk to, even people working in the European Investment Bank, because I was asking them questions, they didn't know what an ECI is. So imagine the, 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 the average EU citizen, nobody, nobody's aware of 
of what it is. And even journalists very often do the mistake. For example, yesterday I was reading um, an article in which we were mentioning as a petition. It's not a petition, it's, it's more than this, it's really binding. We really need to, to make sure that we advertise this as a binding procedure. It's not binding with the result, but at least it's binding in the sense the commission needs to give you an answer, whether they pursue with initiative or not. Um, so uh, in terms of strategy, we, 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 we send thousands of emails all over Europe to ask NGOs to share the petition. Uh, but we were very lucky because um, uh, the issue got uh, increasingly high in the agenda. All the Spitzen candidates during the European elections were talking about it. Uh, they were almost all, all of them in favor, and uh, it's getting even higher in the agenda. And uh, uh, it was even announced yesterday as part of the uh, Green Deal that uh, the Commission intends to uh, propose to the member states to uh, end the Kurzin tax exemption. So I think we're done with the, uh, collect with the collection of signatures. Uh, I'm really happy about it because we wouldn't have made it. We collected 65,000 uh, signatures in six months and a half, which is, n which is definitely uh, not bad, but obviously still very far away from, from the one million. Um, so yeah, we're very happy about that the commission took up the, the, the initiative and uh, we hope that they listen to those 65,000 uh, EU citizens that really uh, took their time to, to sign the ECI. And um, yeah, we hope that, and I really believe that it also had an impact because obviously in the council, the Netherlands and Belgium and Sweden were, were really pushing for it, but also it was very nice to, to, to have this uh, bottom-up uh, uh, lobbying, this citizen lobbying through the ECI. And we, I think, yeah, we, we, we sent thousands of emails to the commission as well. So it really showed to the commission that there was a will from EU citizens to, 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 do, to do something. So even though, and I'm gonna finish like this, even though the ECI is not, a perfect instrument because getting the one million signatures is extremely challenging. At least it really shows policymakers, whether they're in the Commission or in the Parliament or even in the Council, if you if you really try to to engage with them, that EU citizens care about very important issues. And um, yeah, it's it's that's why I really believe that the ECI obviously must be improved, uh, but it's already impactful in a way that it kind of uh, instit institutionalizes a movement. You, we, you, you institutionalize your demand and you can really engage more officially with policymakers. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really good uh, lobbying instrument. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna finish like this. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much. Just a quick comment on what Timo said. Um, he's part of the ECI European Citizen Initiative promoters who signed the open letter that we sent to the Vice Commissioner Jurava two days ago, where basically as ECI promoters and coordinators, um, starting from Marco and Carlo um, and Pier Virgilio D'Astoli for the rule of law ECI, and Veneta Magistrelli is here with us from another ECI committee. Basically, we are asking the Commissioner to consider to, um, on one side, um, in create a, a stronger budget for impo information on the European Citizen Initiative and participatory democracy in general. Plus, there is a second request on the letter, which is about uh, creating an opportunity for the public service journalists to be more informed about what it is an European Citizen Initiative. Because if these guys, with the amazing work they did, reached 65,000 people, which is a great number, imagine if people knew about the, ACI, the European Citizen Initiative in itself and if the media, um, the people responsible of information in Europe would have the responsibility to be aware of the tool. So it's a double-folded topic and uh, it's great that as people using this tool, we collaborate on trying to make it better. Thank you. Thank you for your enthusiastic presentation and for sharing difficulties, but also the enthusiasm that I feel is kind of keeping you going um, across all the difficulties. And thanks to Virginia for having added something about the um, network of um, information, in fact, that we need to have for streamlining uh, European citizen initiatives more. Um, I now move quickly to Andrea Salimbeni. Andrea Salimbeni is sitting next to me. Um, he's 
being part of the group of people who have been working on um, this specific European Citizens Initiative also on carbon pricing. Uh, Andrea uh, is a researcher at Record, which is a um, research company, which is a spin-off of the University of Florence. And uh, in humans, coordinates uh, the campaigns and initiatives uh, in the framework of circular economy. So what is going to... Uh, Carbon pricing um, initiatives, would this result into a European policy, which is what we hope to see happening? How it will, what will be the implications for the transition of the European economic model from the current model to a circular economy model? Thank you, Andrea. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Claudia, for the introduction. Um, I heard a lot of uh, good input regarding the, the issues of, uh, in general, carrying on the uh, new policy measures for environment and actually to bring a real change in the framework. Um, I think that there is a, uh, an additional challenge that we face, which is uh, that usually people uh, take care about their own backyard and they don't feel the urgency until they don't have in front of them. Um, so uh, I will try to take this eight minutes to, to explain how the, the carbon pricing could have a good impact on economics and, and life quality um, of uh, citizens at home, actually. Um, the way is uh, to assess and uh, demonstrate that the positive impact of this initiative is also on reducing, for example, waste taxes, the waste taxes that uh, every citizen pays um, in Europe. Uh, what is the, the role of carbon pricing? The, the role of, of a carbon tax is to reduce the gap in terms of economic competitiveness uh, of renewable or sustainable products, including fuels, biofuels for avi aviation, for example, um, in comparison with the, the fossil brothers. <laughs> um, because uh, we must start from uh, a certain point, which is, uh, it is very difficult. I'm doing research on bioproducts and uh, alternative products. Uh, we cannot be competitive with uh, fossil products because of a simple uh, reason. The, the, the production system is different. We do not extract from the, the soil or from the rocks. We have to produce from complicated raw materials, which are uh, um, wind or even, uh, for example, waste in this specific case. The Commission has done a great job starting from uh, the circular economy package to identify uh, new uh, sources uh, for sustainable products starting from waste. So the point is uh, what we can do now to really support uh, a new economy which uh, starts from getting the value from residual materials like bio-waste or even any other product, producing uh, a new value, a new product which can replace the fossil products. I give a few examples. Um, kerosene in aviation uh, can be replaced by bio-kerosene, but of course the cost is four times. So the way you have to make biokerosene competitive is to put a, carbon, a price on carbon. Uh, coal in steel companies can be replaced by biocoal, even produced from waste materials. But that biocoal has a cost, and the cost is, of course, at least double on what is the cost of the Chinese coal they get. So the way you have to make that biocoal competitive is to put a price on the CO2. Then, uh, why we say that this solution could have a positive, a good impact on uh, citizens' uh, savings, for, for example, for waste taxes. Um, I go quite uh, deeply on how the waste sector uh, works now and how it could change with this solution. Um, so far, uh, the issue is that if I have to treat waste to produce a, a product, uh, I start from the point that my product cannot be competitive with other products which are fossil-based. So I take all the money from the treatment fee I get. 
all the plants that treat waste, even bio waste, they get the money from the fee they they get for treating it at the gate of their plant. The treatment fee is directly influencing the waste tax that every citizen has to pay. So, where is the value in the circular economy if the end product that we have they have no value? For example. Uh, compost or other products, uh, they are secondary materials. That means that they are uh, low cost. If we put the basis for changing this system and bringing these new products, waste-derived products, to be competitive with existing fossil-based products, then we change even our waste management system, because then treating a waste will become a business because of the value of the end product I could have, because I will be competitive with other fossil products. And um, I want to give some example to explain why the, so the, the carbon pricing is an example that can be useful for many other sectors, not only energy. Um, the Commission has done another great job, which is identifying critical raw materials. So that materials that are uh, rare in our planet and that we are exploiting at high rate, creating uh, a, an unbalanced uh, consumption. They say we have to stop extracting from the soil, from the earth. We have to recover from the waste we produce instead of disposing in landfills. But this product, I give you an example. Phosphorus is one of the most critical products, elements. Uh, we are importing from Morocco, from uh, Nigeria, from Egypt. Then, uh, if I want to extract phosphorus from my waste, my phosphorus will cost three times. Then I have just one way to be competitive. Re putting taxes on the phosphorus I import, considering the environmental impact of extraction of phosphorus and transportation of phosphorus. So this is important because it will generate not only a reduction on emission, but also a new economy which will be based on local materials, which is because waste is a local material. And it is for this reason that uh, also uh, with humans, we are proposing a new regulation at local level in cities, in small town, uh, concerning new approaches to waste management that will focus on having a value from the end of waste products. We, and that value will be not only their value as a resource, but their environmental value. So we have to start thinking about the environmental value of a product. I have just finished that. I don't know if I was in time. Yeah, well, you were perfectly in time, actually. I'm very happy. Thank you very much. Also because you, I think, condensed um, um, a very effective reasoning in your presentation. So I think you were able to connect very well with the previous presentation. Um, I just want to share an anecdote that I was thinking of when first Timothy and Daniel were speaking. When on the 18th of October we held the second event of Science for Democracy. First was held in London and the second was held in The Hague, where I do live. And, um, well, a, a former student mate of mine joined the event, Ligeia Paletti. She's an engineer and she works for the uh, Dutch uh, Aviation Authority from the really technical perspectives. But at some, at some point she made a comment that I think that condenses perfectly and captures perfectly what you were describing. She said, it's time for the, fl for the, um, for the price of a flight ticket to really reflect the cost of a flight ticket. And I think this is really captures perfectly what you are saying. Um, well, for, for the first, for the panel on the ECI, we are um, by now ready. I just thank you very much for all your contributions. I want to give the uh, word to Anita Bernacchia and uh, Giorgio Lorosa, who has just joined us. Thank you for being with us. Anita and Giorgio uh, follow up on these presentations by uh, just giving an example of an initiative uh, that I think um, is really perfectly aligned with uh, the spirit of the initiatives that we have been discussing so far. 
Um, Anita and Giorgio are in the uh, direct directory directions. I don't know how to translate this very the board. board of uh, um, an Italian party who is also a venue here in Brussels. Uh, the name of the party is Più Europa. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Humans and Science for Democracy, for uh, having us here, for accepting thank our you. Thanks for accepting our contribution to the debate today. Uh, so, uh, we are from uh, the local section of Pio Europa, as Claudia pointed out. We have been active uh, since the end of 2017, uh, coordinating the uh, electoral campaign for the European constituency. Uh, what I want to present briefly now is uh, one of our initiatives. We can say it's our flagship initiative uh, this year. Uh, which is a citizens' initiative uh, law proposal. So maybe a bit in line uh, with what you are, uh, we have you have presented uh, today, uh, but from another perspective. So it's called uh, Figli Costituenti, which in uh, in Italian in, into English translates uh, uh, founding children, uh, remembering the the founding fathers of uh, the Italian Constitution back in the 1940s, and it's. Uh, um, it was conceived as a, a citizen's law uh, proposal to uh, introduce uh, three uh, important uh, pillars in the Italian constitution, which are uh, being left out uh, from any uh, democratic uh, decision-making process, so namely uh, intergenerational equity, uh, environmental protection, and sustainable development. Uh, in order to, uh, so when any law is being drafted and is being conceived today, uh, young people, uh, the young generation, are not being taken into consideration, but the decisions that uh, uh, the older generations uh, uh, take today actually uh, involve them and regard them, and uh, if they are not involved in this process, uh, so they will suffer the consequences tomorrow. And so, in order to give them, in a way, an instrument to, uh, to have an influence on the, on the future, we have thought that uh, uh, this could be uh, a way to actually, uh, um, to actually oblige um, the, the, the older generations that uh, govern the world today, that govern Italy today, to, um, to be obliged to uh, include their rights in the Constitution. Um, so the, the, the objective was to gather 50,000 signatures. Uh, the objective was not reached, but it is now the object uh, of a petition uh, which has been sent to, to the Italian Senate uh, last week. And uh, the proposal was also included in a, in a, in a design, uh, in a constitutional uh, law bill that uh, Emma Bonino, our senator, presented to the Italian Senate. Uh, so in Brussels, we have uh, promoted this uh, initiative in uh, many ways, and I will leave now the floor to my colleague, uh, Giorgio, to, uh, to tell you more about it. Yeah, thank you very much, Anita. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in fact, in Brussels, we presented um, the initiative at the Jubal Democracy Festival. Um, um, uh, in uh, in autumn, and that was a great experience also to uh, speak to uh, an international audience about our proposal, because in fact we learned that also other countries are looking into this, into putting inside the constitutional law of their countries these fundamental uh, principles of ec economical sustainability, um, social and judicial sustainability, and also this difficult word in English, intergenerational equity. But that we find very important, because in fact, as Anita was saying, the problem today is that the younger generation, they don't vote, they are below 18 years old, but uh, they can't advocate for themselves, but the decisions that we make for them, they impact, they impact them, and they will impact them in the future. So, uh, yeah, we, we will follow now in the Italian Senate uh, how the, the proposal will uh, will go. Uh, luckily, we know that uh, this is something in the Italian, in the center of the Italian political debate as the, our president of, of our prime minister also raised this. Um, uh, and as often happens, big parties take ideas from small parties without crediting, but we are happy about this because it means that maybe this can, can make an impact in the future. Thank you. 
just to add something, so we, we are having store other initiatives in Brussels in order to, uh, to involve other, uh, so we don't have any MEPs in the European Parliament, but we want to collaborate with uh, the Liberal family, not only with them, but uh, with all MEPs who would be keen on, uh, uh, on collaborating with us, and we are open to any, uh, uh, to any proposal. Thanks to you. Um, sorry if I was moving around, there were some logistic information to be shared. I have to say that I also have the luck to know very well Filio Costituenti and what I think will be the take-home message from the audience of today are not familiar with this initiative. The principle of intergenerational equity, and that's what I said introducing it, motivates all the initiatives they have been talking about today. It is not in our direct interest maybe to act on climate change, but it certainly is in the interest of the future generations. Filio Costituenti tries to bring this concept, this notion, this objective, at constitutional law level. So in this sense, it was a very good initiative to have him with us today, to have him been presented. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, this last presentation concludes uh, our part on concrete initiatives, whether at the national or at the European level, uh, regarding climate, climate change and environment. I just pass now to uh, the testimony to Marco Perduca, who will introduce the next part of our program. Thank you, Marco.